Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you very much uh, for coming through. We'll just wait another minute or so while people are still uh, logging on. Okay, I think let's get started. Uh, those that uh, are joining will get just three as we go along. Uh, I had a good day to all of you. I can't say good afternoon because I'm seeing you all uh, dialing from different places. Uh, thank you and uh, welcome uh, to the webinar. Uh, this webinar is a continuation of the previous sets of webinars that we had, where we essentially were looking at the recovery of the tourism sector. Um, a lot has happened since we last did our third webinar. Uh, to give you a bit of a sense, three webinars, 13 panelists, and we had over 4,000 people coming through and 426 questions and, and information. So really, really active sector that is taking a keen interest within their space. Uh, also, thank you very much for um, accommodating uh, the shift of time uh, from the previous 1230 to uh, 1500 hours, which is now. Um, and I'm sure all of you, um, it was worthwhile uh, the waiting itself. Um, I want to uh, welcome the Minister of Tourism, uh, Mamlo Gokubangubani. Welcome, uh, Minister, and thank you very much for taking time out of your business schedule to uh, join us today. Thank you, um, CEO, and afternoon, everyone, or greetings, everyone, depending where everybody is, is based. Um, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, and, and indeed, sincere apologies for... for uh, late joining um, due to my other commitments as a member of um, the NCC. Absolutely. Minister, there's just so many things uh, that we are going to be touching on today and we really want to take the time, you know, for, uh, to take the industry into your confidence on some of your thoughts and views in terms of uh, where we're at. Um, it is obviously a sector that is uh, hit very hard. Every day we read of a an airline who is not able to make it and going to rescue, and this is a global phenomenon. The borders are closed, are closed, and uh, we have now uh, a risk-adjusted framework that the country has, sitting at level four from next week. But tourism is rated at level one and a bit of level two. You know, kind of get some thoughts around that side. Now, before we start, uh, Minister, you're not only the Minister of Tourism, but you also hold a couple of roles within Cabinet itself. One is that you are the chair of the economic cluster in parliament. Number two is you are the member of the National COVID Command Center. Can you just give us a sense, what are these two portfolios about and what does it entail? Um, yeah, I just decided to change my, my background <laughs> um, to remind us what we are about um, tourism, that we, we will travel again. Um, mm -hmm. Indeed, my... My work um, is quite uh, more than just being a Minister of Tourism. In Cabinet, we do belong to various, portfolio, um, various responsibilities beyond just being a Minister of a portfolio. Um, so for myself, I'm also the Chair of the Economic Cluster together with Minister Mandashe. So we have about five clusters and all the cluster groups, clusters will have two ministers who are co chairperson their responsibilities to coordinate work around that area. For example, with us now in the economic cluster, the past weeks have been quite a lot of um, pressure because we had to coordinate the response mechanism that president announced in terms of economic recovery. Um, so working, you would go to, it involves um, almost asking for inputs from various departments, look, test, consult with other people, meet with the advisor, we met with the advisor of the president, advisory panel of the president, to understand whether what we have as proposals make sense. You would have sessions with economists to listen to them. So it involves quite a lot of things. So that's one of the things that I do. I'm also a member of the National Command Council. It started as an IMC, which I've been part of, um, where we started working as the issue of COVID-19 started. President put together a team of ministers to work together with Minister Mkize to look at our response, prepare, look at what the world is doing and all that. So that's the work that we've been doing um, over time and then eventually it became a command council as President announced now that we are working with the command council. But under the command council, you still have substructures. 
for example, um, we've been working on regulations for the past two days. I can say uh, one time, I mean, I was, that's why those who are following me on my social media would see that I wrote that holidays has been crushed, um, weekdays have been smashed. There's nothing because we had started a meeting at seven, we finished the following day at 1 a.m. because we had to work around the clock to get um, the regulations done and start looking at what it means towards um, uh, opening. It's obviously a huge responsibility. You still have to look at what you have to do and also what the broader um, society is about, what South Africans are seeing. I'm also a member of various IMCs um, in the tourism related. It will be an IMC that is working on SAA recovery or dealing with the challenges that is faced by SAA. So it's one of the issues that I'm part of. So there's quite a lot of things that we do. I'm also part of the, what we call IMTT that is responsible for, after we did section, nine, uh, section 100 to Northwest, then we became part of that. I'm part of the Presidential Economic Advisor Panel um, as an IMC member there as well, looking at economic issues. So quite a lot of things that involves economic issues because of being a co-chairperson of the cluster. I automatically form part of those. So most of those background meetings, that's what we'd be sitting, consulting, listening to people, sectors, and also around our work. So that's that's what, in a nutshell, uh, the work of, of, of a minister uh, like myself. Well, minister, thank you very much for the background. And we're also aware that um, you have also just come out of the NCC meeting as well. This hence the delay itself. So hopefully we'll be getting some uh, fresh from the oven information in terms of what is happening around the sector. So, yeah, so no, not, not yet, CISA. Um, there's still we're not yet finalised um, because the president had to join AU this afternoon. Um, he's convened a meeting of heads of states. So the NCC continues tomorrow morning. So okay. all the issues, yeah. I think even the media briefing that was scheduled for this afternoon will be moved to tomorrow so that um, everybody can be able to um, get details of everything. So quite a number of things that you'd have received, for example, I know many of the people would be worried about um, either higher education or basic education by nature of all of us being family members and parents. Um, that announcement will be tomorrow. And all decisions have not been finalized. So. Um, NCC will consider that tomorrow. Um, also, the regulations will be announced tomorrow. So all those breast briefings that were meant to be today, that we're dealing with those two will be tomorrow because we have not finalized the work. Okay. okay. Thank you, Minister. So uh, just to give you a bit of a sense, we've had three webinars and it's really about soliciting views from a couple of uh, panelists from different uh, spheres of tourism in itself and also taking up a lot of information insights from the members as well. And there are certain themes that are starting to come through about our recovery. And one of them is really strongly around is going to be domestic tourism led, then regional, then international. I think some of the things that are still up in the air as to uh, how the sector reorientates itself for a post-COVID environment. Can I give over to you just to spend some time and, and give us a sense in terms of uh, what you are seeing, Minister, and what are some of the things that you'd like to share with the sector, as I'm sure there's a lot of questions uh, coming through. And, and for everyone else, I'll be going through some of the questions and picking them up, and then at the end, I'll probably pose one or two for the Minister and pick up any that are, are coming my way as well. Okay, no thanks, Tisa. Uh, I think for me, one of the, the first thing I, I do need to appreciate the work that has been done um, into that you've put together with the team consulting, uh, as I'd asked you to do, because um, the past few weeks were literally us getting more of the work around the NCC, National Command Council, happening but also the work in the economic cluster. So it became a bit of a challenge. And my fear was that we literally <clears throat> leaving a huge gap, sorry about that, we're leaving a huge gap in terms of starting to have conversations about what we need to do. So I really appreciate and, and, and seeing this continuing um, as a conversation. I do want to indicate upfront that this is not the first or the last one from me. We'll continue to have I try my best to have conversation both that um, are going to be organized through by um, 
SAT, but I've been invited by various um, organizations to speak. Um, I had one conversation this week um, that focused mainly around entrepreneurs in the sector. So we do try and then in the process as well, I've been engaging various organizations on matters that I thought I should hear from them. I've been talking to TBCSA as well as part of the conversations just to give feedback, but bounce back ideas with them, especially with relating to how we deal with the, the pandemic um, as the tourism sector. Um, so we all know that the travel and tourism has already suffered the most devastating setbacks um, since the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic, yet the full impact of the pandemic to the tourism sector is still yet unknown. Um, we, we are anticipating to say this is what is happening now, but how long it will take, all that is dependent on how we respond to the, to the virus. Now, part of our work is to be able to assess in terms of globally what is being said. And if you look at what the United Nations World Tourism Organization, it estimated that tourist arrival could decline by 20 to 30% in 2020. So others are saying, actually, um, that estimation is now out of the way because when we look realistically, we are now almost in May. And a lot of us, when we look at projections in terms of how the, the virus is growing, it's clear that we only managed to get the two months, which is January and February. We likely not to get any other month in terms of international travel. So will that, the two months that we've had, contribute to 20 to 30% of overall? I doubt so. So for me, as we look at that, the projections continues to be adjusted, but we use them as a way of analyzing and testing and almost getting it as a projection to say, okay, this is what is likely to happen and we can start working around our response to it. And if you look in terms of the translation, just that 20 to 30% globally, it will translate to between 300 to 450 um, US, uh, 300 to 450 billions, US billions. So are we able to translate it into South African? Definitely we can be able to start saying, this is almost an issue. If you see this as 20 to 30% globally, and you're seeing this in terms of international, so you know that we're going to be worse off as South Africa. Similarly, WTTC analysis also showed a sharp escalation in the economic loss to the world economy, up to 2.7 trillion of GDP. And this will put almost the estimation, it says that almost 75 million jobs are at risk, specifically in the G20 countries. We're part of the G20 countries, and therefore, this is not theory now for us, it's a reality because we're seeing it as it happens today. Now, as we say, we, we can, it's not difficult to predict what will happen to us. Um, escalation in terms of economic loss for us, uh, we're going to see a lot of job losses. Um, as we're seeing that this is because the lockdown which were imposed to contain the spread of virus, curtail both the supply and the demand side of tourism market. In essence, the lockdown has rendered the tourism industry ineffective. So we've closed, the borders are closed, the skies are closed, uh, and only what we see in the skies is those who are being repatriated either back into the country or are repatriated out of the country. We must appreciate and applaud the fact that thus far, our efforts to contain the virus have resulted in the suppression of the spread of the virus. At the same time, um, the need for the prevention of the crisis in jobs and the destruction of livelihood has arisen very sharply. Thus, there is a need to keep a delicate balance between protecting people from the COVID-19 and avoiding economic devastation. Some of the colleagues argue that um, you, know, you can push to have economic activities. But if we do not manage the virus better, the virus will shut the economy down and that will be the worst. So it's better when you manage the economy, you manage the virus and you can control the economic activities. So this is what I want colleagues um, and everybody who's here 
to remember and understand that as we work, our intention mainly as government is to ensure that we don't reach a point where the virus shuts the economy down. And just to make an example, if you have a factory or if you have a hotel, you'd understand that once there's a case, that hotel ceases to function. Or if you have a factory, there's a case of in that factory, that factory stops to function. So one of the things that we constantly trying to make sure that there's a balance is to make sure that we don't have in many incidences of positive cases in factories, in areas of work, in our economic activity to the point that it shuts them down. So that's the delicate balance that we always have to do. And that's why accordingly, our government had to adopt the risk adjusted approach, which consists in sequencing, sequenced and phased in opening up of key sectors and priorities areas with a view to intensify the fight against COVID-19 whilst rebuilding our economy. Because the tourism sector thrives on social interaction, it will take longer for businesses in the sector to come back to full operation. So this is what as well I want colleagues to remember. As minister and the department, we present every time to NetJoint, we have a structure called NetJoint. NetJoint, it's where the Director General of the department sits and then the National Command Council, it's where uh, minister sits. So the NetJoint is more a technical team. There we have people who are in the military security cluster. We have people who are in epidemiology, the people who are dealing with the virus and all those things. So they are the ones that when we submit proposals to say this is what we want activities to happen, they are the ones who are reflecting on what we are seeing and testing what we are seeing. So that's why it's important for me to explain this so that you understand. In the meantime, we need to create mechanisms to protect the most vulnerable segments of the sector, such as SMMEs, self-employed women and youth. Now you'd note that um, as the department, we introduced the Tourism Relief Fund as part of assisting the SMMEs in the sector. And thus far, we've received more than 10,000 applications. We've set aside um, 200 million as a fund. This was done initially. Um, and we were hoping that we'll start working on it in terms of phases. Phase one, we went to ask for this money as the beginning to say, can we have 200 million support? It's kept at 50,000 per entity you apply. And then we, we are able to allocate. Unfortunately, we've not been able to allocate, as many of you would know, um, we've been taken to court, challenged by Solidarity and RF Forum, specifically um, challenging the use of broad-based broad black economic empowerment as one of the criteria to score for the fund. Um, and we were in court yesterday, um, and the judge has promised that before the end of the week or by latest Friday, we will get a, a judgment. And we're hoping that this can come because I've been receiving quite a lot of emails, quite a lot of calls in, on my Twitter line, um, my Facebook, people saying, when are you distributing? So we do know that this is highly needed and it needs to go. Uh, but I think it's important for me to contextualize because many of the people don't understand. In terms of the BE codes, which are sector codes that have been adopted by the sector and that have become policy and within the laws of this country. It stipulates that the minister is not, it's obligated, it actually says the minister is obligated when providing grants or any form of financial or economic relief to use the BE codes as a criteria. So it's not optional for a minister and that's why we went to court to defend this. So to say, if I as a minister decide when and when not to apply the laws, I could be regarded as a rogue minister. I could be regarded as having violated my oath of office, end up with a PP or end up with um, parliament's ethics and therefore having to be withdrawn in terms of my being a member of parliament, but also a minister. So there are huge consequences should I be found to have violated my oath of office. And that's why we welcomed that if indeed we can agree with the parties on what the law says, it's best that the courts be the ones that are able to. 
But I think one of the things that later, as part of our recovery and as part of our conversation, is to be able to bring back the conversation around the PEP. What is our understanding of broad-based like broad black economic empowerment and its requirements? But also, do we think that indeed it is discriminatory? Or do we think that transformational issues are not important for us as a sector? And I think that's something that we need to come back to and have a conversation as a sector and say, where do we stand and what our views are? Now, the other issue just coming into that, one has to acknowledge that there's quite a lot of feedback even for many of our sector people that says 200 million is not enough minister. And I do accept it's not enough. Um, it's not enough because we've come to a standstill. It's not enough because we don't have any activities. It's not enough because our challenges are more. We need to be saved by government as a sector. And that has been recognized by government. But what we, when we went forward, we said, rather than having sector-based support interventions, that's where government came with broader support intervention mechanisms that responds across because then it gives various ministers responsibilities to be able to speak to. So government introduced, for example, a 200 billion loan guarantee scheme in partnership with the major banks, the National Treasury and South African Reserve Bank. The initial phase of this scheme is for companies with 10 over or less than 300 million a year. And most of these tourism businesses fall within this category. So I do encourage everybody to apply within the sector so that this is an opportunity that you can be able to get. Minister Mwini has committed that all the details will be provided this week as we announced even yesterday when I was leading um, the sector, the economic cluster media briefing. But furthermore, what we have been doing as the department is that we have also been working in close collaboration with the Department of Labor and Employment um, labor Formation and the Tourism Business Council of South Africa to expedite UIF application for tourism businesses. So far, we've received more than 25,000 applications, and we believe this also assists in saving jobs in the sector so that those who are not able to pay jobs who have sent workers um, at home, at least the workers can continue to have an income. And you do not have, as a person who's running the business, um, to carry the burden of having to pay the salaries. And we think this as well is one of the ways that we're trying to assist the sector, but also as government broadly trying to assist businesses. While it is important to support the sector so that it can be able to weather the storm, there is a need to start planning for the recovery of the sector in the post COVID-19 period. The global nature of the pandemic means that the measures to keep the spread, such as travel restrictions and border closures, have been worldwide phenomenon. This means that any recovery planning that is not in line with global coordinated efforts will be a futile exercise. And this is critical that we need to note. Um, regarding global coordination, I must indicate that um, we've been part of um, various platforms and discussions. We had engagement with the AU countries um, responsible for, led by the commission, responsible for tourism, we had a meeting of G20 countries, UN, WTO, have been engaging with WTTC to look at how we can develop a global approach to a recovery for the tourism sector. With the AU meeting, the first meeting that we set, um, we agreed that we're going to have a, a team, sort of task force, um, that is going to look at the recovery. As South Africa, we volunteer technical support um, myself as the minister, I did not, I'm not going to sit in that task team because we have two members of the SADC region that is going to sit. The CAF chairperson of um, the CAF chairperson, a minister of Z Zambia will sit, we nominated him. And also the subcommittee chair on tourism on, and on AU is from Lesotho, so the minister will sit. What we availed ourselves as, as South Africa is more technical support and also bringing some of the private sector players to influence and input into what is being drafted. We've agreed that within at least three to four weeks that we have a draft document that we can be able to look at. With the UN WTO, when the meeting was convened, all these meetings are convened virtually, which I participate. Um, we looked at various issues that came there. 
um, we had one of the professors from Harvard. It was organized in collaboration with MasterCard Center. And this was looking at inclusive growth and recovery of tourism. We looked at various issues, presentation, and major message that came through from uh, the academics were saying to us, actually, what we must be doing for international tourism to go back to where it is. We should be, our plan should be in line with the vaccine recovery or vaccine um, tests and, and implementation, because they believe that uh, international tourism is going to recover once we have a vaccine because they do believe that it's going to be difficult for people to believe in traveling again. It's going to be difficult for countries to open up fully when they do not have a vaccine. So, and also one of the things that was highlighted there is that one of the things that we are going to have to start paying attention to as the tourism sector is possibilities of new regulations, health regulations that will come following COVID-19 that was not a, a requirement previously. So you are likely to see countries starting to say, when you travel, this is what either a requirement of a medical certificate or something. So those are the things that we need to start paying attention. I saw the other day, somebody had shown what becomes a, in, in one of the global uh, conversations I was part of. Uh, it was showing a typical of what they think is a model of a flight in the future where people are not sitting close together, coming together, but literally the other one looking that way, the other one looking that way, and there's a, something that divides in between them. So that's what uh, the professors as well were advising us to start thinking outside the box and thinking about what is likely to come. The regulations, the things are going to be requirements, maybe requirements of mask, requirements of this, in terms of temperature, so what does it mean if it puts some of the requirements to say if you host a conference, these are the things that you must have. So they were saying we must start paying attention into that area. Then we held a meeting in G20 um, presidency, uh, convened by Kingdom of, sorry, G20 meet, ministers meeting. Um, the chairperson or the presidency is held by Saudi Arabia, convened as well. Uh, virtually also sharing experiences which was quite important. We had um, various count, uh, organizations, OECD participated, WTCC participated, um, UNSG, uh, UNWTO, SG participated, and all of them were making inputs. But also countries were sharing experiences. Here we were looking at what are countries doing, what is the support um, that we are providing for sectors, uh, are there support that is needed per region, and that's what was the conversations that we were having. So for each part, um, for example, WTTC during the meeting actually uh, proposed that the G20 ministers meeting needs to fully jointly commit with the private sector to four key principles to achieve and faster recovery. This will include a uh, private sector in the coordinated response, ensuring all measures put in the um, put that the travel at the, uh, sorry, all measures put, all measures put the traveler at the heart of their actions. This would include a seamless travel, traveler journey with enhanced health security standards, enable, uh, enable through technology developing joint public private and G20 wild health protocol, as well as ongoing support packages for the tourism sector beyond lifting of lockdown and into the recovery. So they were also talking about the issues that shouldn't we be one of the people that starts looking and driving the issues around what would be the requirement going forward. So those are some of the things that at global level we are discussing and we've been looking at. Now, consistent with the theme that has been coming with um, international countries and what we've been doing, then we decided as well to say, okay, this is the work that we are doing. And also, we needed to start as well ourselves putting more efforts in ensuring that we can be able to see our work coming through. So the consistent theme emerging from this global institution is for countries to develop a coordinated approach to the recovery of tourism sector. Other necessary commitments include supporting the sector during the crisis to save businesses and jobs, development of a framework to advance sustainable tourism, investing in the market intelligence system and digital transformation and development of government framework for tourism at levels, at all levels. 
And also, in, in the end, each country needs to develop its own recovery plan that is informed by the prevailing conditions in each country. The risk-adjusted approach that we have as South Africa gives us a framework within which we can curve our path towards recovery for the tourism sector in South Africa. The involvement of all tourism stakeholders is absolutely important, um, which is the reason why we have convened this webinar. Based on the COVID-19 web uh, epidemic uh, expected tragedy, the best case scenario is that the tourism sector recovery will only begin to recover towards the end of this year. In terms of domestic, the first phase of recovery will be, be driven by domestic tourism followed by regional tourism and then international tourism will only start coming into operation next year. So international tourism, as we say, we're likely to see that next year. Now, amongst other things, our planning process needs to do, take into uh, the following important elements of the recovery. Analysis of the impact of COVID-19 on the economy globally and domestically. Analysis of the impact um, of COVID-19 on the tourism sector, on the demand and supply for each subsector for all of the tourism industry. Analysis of the epidemiological scenarios predicted. We would have been followed while, following what Professor Karim was presenting publicly in terms of the curve and what needs to be doing, um, what we need to be doing and what we need to be following. So that is important for us to be able to start following. So predictions, as well as I said, it's recovery both domestically first, recovery for regional, recovery international. Then again, alignment, uh, aligning our recovery plan with international framework, it's important so that we are not left behind. Identification of strategic intervention to revive domestic supply side of the tourism sector, given the epidemiological scenarios. One of the things that we've got to start saying, how do we do domestic marketing? What is it that we need to put in place? Are we starting going to look at, okay, many of South Africans, they would have stayed in the houses for too long, and therefore by the time lockdown comes, they are likely to want to leave their houses. What is the message that we're going to have? And what are the packages that we're going to put together to make sure that they are able to leave their houses? Then from there, it will be the global marketing, starting to make sure that in terms of global marketing, and my view is that you need to go to the countries or the regions that are more risk averse, um, and then follow with those that are very sensitive in terms of taking risks, but also your markets that have been loyal to you. Those will be, because it's almost like you go and defend your market, where you are, but if you want to penetrate, go to the markets that are risk averse because they will be easy to move and would not worry more about the pandemic, even if the pandemic has passed. So that will give you the, that, that um, advantage. So identification, again, of strategic intervention to match the supply and demand tourism product, given epidemiological uh, scenarios. So these are some of the issues I just wanted to share in terms of the work. But our view is more important that we need to be consistently being able to say, we are going to deal with the current situation. We are going to make sure that we support the country in dealing with the pandemic because it doesn't affect us only as business or as a sector, but it affects us as human beings and as parents, as family members. Then when we move from there, then we say, what are the things that we are going to do to contribute towards the country's recovery? What are the things that we are going to do to contribute to making sure that this country can recover? But again, my responsibility as the minister has been saying that it will be the issue of me making sure that the place is still remains. I say to my, the DG and the team, I get worried more about when we start opening and say people are going to travel. Are they going to find the BNB still there? Um, they're going to find the attraction still there. So part of the work that I would want to do is to make sure that we still preserve what we have. We don't lose what we have while we are going to be able to encourage people to come and travel. So with those, um, I know I took a bit uh, long on your sister, but I thought, let me share these views, give a global sure. perspective and the engagements which we've been having and what are the trends that are coming and what would influence what becomes our tourism recovery strategy as we put together that document. We're looking at having a document that is tangible that says this is our tourism recovery 
as South Africa and that we can share with everybody in the country, but we have received inputs. I know others are writing to you, sister, giving you yep. written explanations others have been doing. So we'll take that together, compile it, and also we believe that we'll be able to help even on the continent, not only SADC, the continent, but globally, share our work that we've been doing. Because so far, I think we're one of the frontliners who are running extremely in starting to drive the process of tourism recovery. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. Thank you, Minister. Thank you for the quite comprehensive overview and the global perspective that you are giving us. Um, one of the themes that are coming through from uh, the sector minister is that, uh, you know, hardly six months ago, the tourism sector was a sector that's going to be driving the economy of South Africa. Then COVID happened. Uh, we are now in a risk-adjusted framework, and we are sitting on level four as from the 1st of May. Tourism essentially kicks in on uh, level one and domestic tourism as that. And you've kind of indicated that it's potentially near the end of the year. I suppose, Minister, you've also talked about protecting the supply side, the products, the traders themselves, so that when we do open eventually, there is a tourism sector to speak of. Can you maybe just share with us in terms of what your views are as to between now and end of the year, let's say, in terms of when domestic tourism is able to kick in. How do you hold the sector together? How do you make sure that we've got businesses that are operating? Just some of your thoughts there. Yeah, um, thanks, sister. Look, the issue of, of us looking at the levels, um, one of the things that we started looking at um, with the team, obviously both the department and SAT that I sit with technically asking them to do some work, is to be able to say, are we able to de-risk certain areas in the sector? For example, so that not everyone will be at level at a particular level. So you might have certain areas where they are still high risk. For example, um, issues of festivals, issues of um, conventions, issues of conferences are seen as high risk because if you come together into a room, um, the likelihood and one person is positive, then the likelihood of the spread is higher and all those things. So that is very high. But also, that's what I'm saying, we need to start segmenting the sector and saying, okay, which one is high risk? Which one is low risk? What is it that we can do? Like you'd note that with the proposal that was presented last week, some of the things was to start to say with the restaurant um, industry to, on level five, restaurants were not allowed to operate at all. Then moving to level four, there's a proposal of restaurants to be able to operate with delivery. So, but others are not operating. In level five, you still had hotels, certain hotels operating. This was for specifically quarantine and also as supporting essential services. So you'd have different levels and you'd have different um, activities that are functioning. So that's what is important. What we now started to learn as we interact, and we remember, sister and colleagues, we are not, um, how do I put it? We, we are not really uh, familiar with the virus. We don't have past experiences of dealing with something like this. So other things are trial and error from our side. When you learn and you listen to the colleagues, who are in the center of technical support to say, this is what is risk, this is what is not, then you come back. So we would make submissions to say, this is what we want to do. We want to have the following activities. Then they will look at them, they put them on a matrix. They say, no, this is not the matrix, that the matrix kicks you out. And then you start learning to say, okay, what is it that we need to do? Then we go back and start saying, okay, it means we need to start working towards de-risking our, our sector. Mm -hmm. De-risking, what are the mechanisms that we're going to put in place to ensure that when we come back, we can build a case, a credible case that says, we'd want to see a restaurant fully operational, we'll do the following and present that case in terms of, and, and it gets to be brought in. And then you go and as well and say, what are the things that we can do? So that's what I'm saying for me, is to be able to segment, remove the sector and break it down per area. Accommodation, Mm -hmm. restaurants, tour operating, tour guiding, and all that. But the reality is that, are those things still going to be the same that we were? I mean, all of us can simply say, prior to COVID-19, 
There are certain things we never thought, but post-COVID-19, the world is not going to be the same. Anyone who thinks that the world is going to go back to where it was, it's not going to be true. Now, what we need to do, for example, people are getting used to platforms like this, yes. um, conferencing, meeting. Is the my sector going to be the same going forward? People have learned better ways to do things. And what is the impact? So we've got to really go back and dig deeper and see that. Now, from the level of de-risking the sector, that's what I talk about. What is it that we can do? Now, indeed, where I see, when you look at the epidemiological uh, projections by Prof. Karim, we are likely to have the peak. The worry is winter, but mm -hmm. May, June, July is our winter, and we're likely to have a lot of uh, virus spreading. And with that, we are likely to start seeing a bit of some control around until September, or even the peak towards September. Now, if you are to look at that, then you must give at least two to three months to stabilize. And our issue is one, are we able to start working towards district isolation to ensure that we can make sure that those who are there can actively participate and have their full operation? For example, if there's nothing at, um, let me take an example. If there is no, no incident or cases in Northern Cape, can we push for activities in tourism to go fully operational within the Northern Cape? But you would know that the epicenter is a problem for us. Hmm. And the epicenter, your Johannesburg, your Cape Town and your Devon. And mainly this will be your market because these are the people who have the money to come and spend, maybe coming to Northern Cape. So that, that's what we need to deal with. That's what we need to dissect and be able to bring through in terms of the issue of us getting um, activity. So that's where we are. We continue to be the voice of the sector, preparing, listening and taking the inputs and putting them into the net joint, uh, having feedback obviously given to us by them. So that's, that's where we are. Okay, so, so it's, a, it's a very tight uh, road to walk through, Minister, because on one side, the priority is to preserve life and make sure that we actually get a handle on this pandemic. And uh, South Africa has revered globally as to the stance that is taken. On the other hand, you've got an economic uh, priority, tourism specifically, crying, you know, to kind of get in there. And it's getting the right balance. Uh, the trick would be that. If you open up too quickly, then we may end up regressing up the risk levels as opposed to managing it uh, from the other side. Just to touch on the, the de-risking part, because it essentially empowers the sector to install or put in place health protocols or operational protocols that actually move it up from being a level one to a level two to even say level three, and therefore possibly close the the recovery back as opposed to waiting for the country to come down to, to level one. What would the possible impact on pricing be on that one, Minister? And just to give an example, if an airline says, well, um, to practice social um, health protocols, an example, we will only go 50% capacity of a flight. Uh, that basically means then the cost per seat will go up because people now have to uh, pay for the city they're not occupying. And that probably goes against the, the domestic tourism element, which is very price sensitive. Um, what's your view on these in terms of how do you do them in a way that doesn't throw out the cost side, but also getting people back to work again? Oh, sorry, I'm trying to to see because I, I hear my, my face is moving. Um, Okay, let's yes. let's see. Um, yeah, for me, uh, when I see it's the issue of I'm I'm told my my background is a bit bad, um, so I need because my face is apparently shaky. So I'll have no, to. We see now, final. Uh, no, I was worried about the light. That's why I was doing a background. Oh, so okay. I see my yes. face is exploding and coming back. The issue for me, Sisa, in terms of us having a conversation is that one has to ensure that we have a, a tourism sector that can respond to the challenge. That's what I'm saying. If we know that we are not going to be the same, if we can sit and think that uh, we are going to continue the way we continued previously as a start, 
It's not going to work. The reality is COVID-19 has changed our life. That's the first thing. Mm. Now, how do we adapt? We can adapt in the sense that, firstly, we look at the package. Obviously, I, I say every time that we are not the people who are in terms of telling the sector to say, go and do the following, uh, change your pricing in this way. But we've got to be able to try and see how do we adapt to the pricing. One of the issues that many people have been raising with us is that as South Africans, if we are to promote domestic tourism, CISA, people are saying it has been too much expensive for them. Mm. And therefore, if it's expensive for them to travel, those are the people that we would want to bring back into as a first market. Are we going to be able to get them? That's for me, the, the issue of pricing. Now, that's where we need to start, having those conversations, packaging them very well, and therefore making sure that we can be able to get what we need in terms of tourism, domestic tourism. Obviously, the market in terms of spending is not the same. Mm. International tourists spend in dollars, and it's a lot of money, compared to South Africans who are going to spend less. Uh, so that's another issue. The second issue is that the reality is that they are going to come out of hardship. Some of them would have less than uh, enough money. So they would want what is affordable, what they can be able to do. So that's what they do. So that's the reality of what we need to be able to do as, as, a, as, a, as an issue of adjusting to the pricing. Obviously, as I'm saying, we can only give recommendation. Mm. And we can't dictate to the sector to say, this is what. That's why the recovery needs to be part of that recovery. Must be what is inputted by the sector into the documents. It must be what the sector says, this is the direction we are going to take. So we can only say to everybody, this is what we think should happen. But in terms of final determination, it's going to be, the sector itself saying, these are the things that we're going to do. And that's why okay. even throughout, when we make inputs to our NCCC, we would meet with either TBCS and say, this is what the issues are coming up. What are your views? And then we'll go there. At times you go, you come back, you are not happy, but the decisions have been taken. And because the decisions, that's why we must always understand the decisions are taken on the basis of the health risk, not more on economic side. And yeah. unfortunately for us as the tourism sector, it becomes a challenge because when it's the risk, then it becomes that people are able to say, no, 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 wait a bit. But another thing I was saying when we were talking that one of the issues that we're going to have to do a lot of advocacy work on this is the issue of people who are feeling that the virus came as a result of traveling. That worries me. We've been engaging with quite a lot and we've been saying one of the things that we have to do in communities so that we protect travel and tourism and for people to be able to visit, but also later when we open and the borders are open, when international tra travelers come, they don't find a hostile community that fears them, that do not want them. So those are some of the things that we've got to be able to deal with. Okay, so Minister, just to uh, uh, recap just what we've just been talking about so that uh, also the participants uh, get an idea is that the TBCSA is probably the biggest body that actually uh, represents the tourism sector. And that in itself, that body where all of the satsas, the sarkis and the different associations sit, they interact with you on a regular basis and are able to proactively put forward uh, mitigating measures that help to deal with the sector, whether it be health protocols or operational protocols, right? And that that becomes a submission from the sector in itself as to how it uh, looks forward to de-risking itself. Uh, am I correct in that assessment? No, definitely. That's what I'm talking about, de-risking. If you look from, from a side, remember, globally or even within the health um, teams, they see tourism as, an, as, an, as a, a sector that is more interactive and social. Now, when you look at dealing with 
the COVID-19. It's about social distancing. That's why it mm. puts us more on the back foot as the first thing. So you would have to, when you go to present to the teams that is technical and say, colleagues, this is what we are going to do. That's why I'm talking about de-risking. Then explaining to say, when we have minds, for example, when we have a conference, we'll make sure that the conference in terms of sitting, this is how people will sit and all that. We'll make sure that as people arrive, we'll be scanned, we'll be doing this and all those things. That's the first thing. And I think colleagues need to understand, this is not only South Africa, it's globally. As I said, mm -hmm. when we meet with G20, when we meet with UNWTO, these are international standards, that's what everybody's doing. We are all meeting virtually, even as ministers, because the travel border, the borders are closed across the world. So that's what we need to do. If we are to look at how do we de-risk, those who are operating as quarantine sites, they will tell you today, that you go to a hotel if you want to be in a quarantine site, there are protocols that you must follow. They give you a list of things, how you will handle the food, how you handle the laundry, how you handle um, the people when they arrive in there. We've changed the way we do things. Mm -hmm. Unless we can be able to contribute that to say, these are the things that we want to do in terms of the sector, and we can be able to do them and prove that this is what. And let me say, for example, yesterday I was followed by um, one journalist who was saying to me, your sector is non-compliant. And many who watched uh, the media briefing would have picked up that I was asked that, why is the sector not compliant? Because hotels are still operating normally. So that's where my concern is. If we do not be, if we're not seen as collaborating and working together with South Africans and working together with the teams that are trying to deal with the virus. We are going to be rejected, but secondly, we are going to be uh, almost seen as people who contributed when people uh, die, when people feel ill, they will blame us. And that's what we had to deal with initially to say, this is not a cause of tourism. So we had to do a lot of work. And that's why when we held meetings, starting with the meeting that we held in Sentin, we were able to say to people, let's try as tourism to ensure that we are not found to be part of the spreading of the virus. And that's important. Okay, Minister. So Minister, if I had to ask uh, another question here, they say, look into your crystal ball. How do you think the, the progression of the country is gonna go down from level four next week, two, three, two, 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 one? Do you have any sense? And I know a lot of it's out of your control, but do you have any sense? If the country does the right things and we behave and uh, we follow the, the laws that have been set, what can we look forward to as a sector and what could possibly the timings be? Um, look, as I'm saying, we, we are guided by the um, presentation that was done publicly as well by Prof Karim. I'm not so sure if members of the sector and colleagues have followed what was presented. If you look at that, you would see that um, they said, the peak will be almost around September. When they say the peak, it means quite a lot of restrictions will still be in place almost around that time. So if you look at the numbers of the uh, new cases, you do see that we are not going down, we are going up. So that's what uh, the team, that um, technical team that supports me joined, looks at and to say this are estimation. So from me, when I look at that, I look at seeing us at least um, optimally, uh, optimistically uh, saying that by at least first week of December, being able to operate in the true sense of it. Okay. Again, I mean, taking into account that should things continue on the same trajectory and the process that we're hitting it. I mean, some, we're still getting a lot of questions around the tourism relief fund. And uh, just some clarification questions. First of all, um, has any money been paid out yet from the Tourism Relief Fund to anybody? Not yet. The money has not been paid because we are still waiting for the court. Um, because when, when the case was sent to court, we took a decision that will await for the court to give us a directive. So we're hoping by end of this week, we should have that court outcome and start um, the process for doing the court outcome. So we have not paid anything. 
Okay, so the court process is essentially holding back uh, the ability of the department to actually pay out the monies themselves. Once the court case has been determined, then, you know, uh, continue to flow on that side. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, the other questions that we are picking up, Minister, is on um, airlines, as an example. Um, let's say we open up our borders uh, come January, February next year. We cannot assume that the same airlines, A, will be existing, actually, at that time. And secondly, that the schedules that we know are still going to continue. How are we looking at this as a sector in terms of making sure that we can connect South Africa to the rest of the world and negotiating with airlines? Um, look, I've, I've been in touch with the local airline industries. Um, they are going through a tough time, like in, in, in global communities. Quite a number of them have sent employees home. Um, we've been looking at mechanisms to be able to support and help them. Obviously, from our side, they are not directly in our portfolio because they fall under the portfolio of um, transport as airlines. But what we have been doing, trying to do, is to listen to what they are raising and also engage with the Minister of Transport together with um, the NCC to look at what can be done. So many of them gave us a projections to say they are likely to have challenges if they are not back in the skies as domestic by end of July. Um, so that's, that's a main difficult issue. Um, and from where we're sitting in terms of the pandemic, the fear is that it's likely to rise in the two months to come because of the winter season. And if you look at that um, presentation, you'd understand that it says that community outspread is likely to start um, moving. But also you look at where the cases are growing, Cape Town, Durban, and Johannesburg as the epicenters. So normally when you follow what globally they are doing, even if the country opens um, other areas, the epicenter, normally the restrictions are not opened. So that becomes also one of the realities. Um, we always hold food. That's why we encourage that compliance. I think the major issue that we've got to be able to pass is that the more we comply, the better that the pandemic can be dealt with and can be dealt with quickly. Colleagues, if they remember my input during um, um, Sentinel meeting, I did make scenarios. I gave scenarios at that time because we we're dealing with the first case and we we're not even yet sure. But on our projections at that time, we we're able to see the projections towards the end of the year to say, if we are able to manage and deal with the virus by at least June, the end of May, June, we'll would be able to see quick recovery in terms of our sector, if you remember my speech that day. Yes. And we knew that if we can't by May, June, we are going to have a huge impact in terms of our businesses. And we said it that we would need to be able to find. So obviously from our side, we'll continue to push because what we believe is while there's not going to be business, at least financial support should be coming to, um, from us as government, from other sectors, either banks and all that. That's why we're the first to call for the banking industry to relax um, the loan repayment, give breaks. We are currently engaging with municipalities We've seen two municipalities coming forth with um, rates and taxes breaks um, that we've asked for. We presented that case during our presidential coordinating committee meeting, which is chaired by the president heavy municipalities. Many of the municipalities actually since that day um, indicated that themselves are facing a dire situation because they're likely not to be able to provide the services of your, what is it called? Services of water, electricity. Mm -hmm. So that becomes a challenge as well. So they raised that to say, we'd love, we love to give all of us uh, you know, breaks in terms of payment of rates and taxes, but it's something that has not left us as government. Uh, we've asked as well the National Treasury to see if they can be able to bring some relief to the municipalities so that the municipalities can give relief to the businesses. So it's something that we're still working on. That's what I'm saying, we're working quite a lot of issues also, um, feedback I got was on the insurances. We've engaged with Minister Mboweni on the insurances as well to assist us. And therefore, one of the things that we are trying to do as well is facilitate engagement with Minister Mboweni with TBCSA as an organized body to be able to present some of the issues that relates to 
one because he regulates the insurances those who are changing some of the rules in the middle of the game, but also those who are not complying in terms of when people say, in terms of our um, insurance, we are requesting that you recognize, you pay us, this is a, for, a false measure or foreclosure, so they don't comply. So those are some of the things, somebody was sharing that in terms of their contract, it says if they do not have access to their facility, therefore they will get um, payment from insurance. So we got that information, we've given it to Minister Mboweni, we are working around the clock to get that resolved as well. So th there are a couple of things that we are working on, CISA, to try and assist uh, in resolving the issues while we're noting that we are trying to de-risk the sector and mm -hmm. try and get the sector back on track in operation. But what are the things that we can be able to provide as a relief measure, as something that will get the businesses not to die and we find them still alive post-COVID? And that's why we had to go in terms of the issues of um, UIF, broad issues around um, the tax relief as well, the payee that government has announced that you do not have to pay, you can submit later, there are no penalties. So those are the things that I want businesses in the sector to pay attention to and also take advantage of. But where they find difficulties, approach us so that we can facilitate and assist them to be able to gain these benefits that exist while we're sorting out, coming back with the activities in terms of our sector. So a really multi-pronged approach, not only looking at the tourism relief fund, but there's also UIF, there's rates and taxes, there's also the 200 billion rand loan guarantee by the banks that the industry can access in terms of uh, holding itself together, I suppose, throughout this period as well. Then, Minister, we spoke about domestic and local tourism. Um, and you gave a view that it could potentially start near the end of the year, if we look at about the December period as well. What, in your advice, should the sector be doing in order to getting itself ready and repositioning itself for this local or domestic tourism near the end of the year? Look, there, there are various things that we've got to pay attention to, um, sister. Obviously, this will have to have quite a lot of inputs from the sector and everybody else. But the first thing for me is to be able to put together packages that will be attractive for people to get out of their houses. Um, campaigns. I mean, we started when when I got into the portfolio. We started to do a lot of work around campaigns in terms of domestic tourism. We're starting to see a lot of people interested in in moving out of their houses, um, going out, taking pictures, narrating about the stories. So we'll have to be creative in terms of our marketing. Obviously, SAT will drive that, for example. But secondly, one of the things that I'm thinking about and and seeing that we can be able to do coming together like we do with Travel Week. So put together a, a packages of post-COVID-19 packages. Put them on a platform where people can access them, um, link them with businesses. So you'd have obviously have a mechanism of people having to register, participate in the packages, put packages to say, this is what I can do. This is what I, I can offer. And then people can know and we can market that. So you have a platform that we can create. That's one of the things I want to see. But also aggregate or segregate what you can provide. Um, if I do not have money enough, uh, where can I, what can I do? Where can I, where can I go? Um, I do believe that it's going to be some time that people are able to go out of the country. Starting to market to say, with the holidays that will be coming towards the end of the year, start working into that and getting the people to start booking and making available the issues, um, making available, um, so not making available, but booking their, their holidays and almost encouraging them to go. But one of the other things that we've been trying to do currently is to talk to those who have bookings, not to cancel, but put, to postpone. So several of them have been coming through to say, no, I want to cancel. You'd have, we talk to them, we respond to them to say, we encourage you not to cancel, but to postpone, because we do believe that is one of the ways that we can be able to sustain the sector and protect the sector. Thank you. So I, uh, I can hear that, that uh, creating platforms, you're actually speaking to me to do my job, Minister. So I, I got that quite well there. Um, what about the, the, the SADC region itself? And we're talking here about the self-drive market, not necessarily the one that the air market that flies in. Um, they are also, 
you know, subject to border control? Uh, will they be sequenced out in a softer version relative to international, meaning those coming by air, or will the borders be open at the same time for both um, soft drive and, uh, and air travel? Um, since I currently, honestly speaking, um, government has not reached that point, um, as I'm saying. The challenge for us is that we're dealing with something that is unknown, and I think I want to appeal to people to understand that. We're dealing with, with an unknown, what we best our solutions or our projections, it's projections that we can do. Uh, what we based, base our decisions in, on projections to say, if this happens, if somebody understands the scenarios, so you do scenarios to say, okay, if we manage the, the virus, this is what will happen, this is what we can do. So I don't want to sit here and commit to say, this is what is going to happen. And then tomorrow the sector says, but the minister committed that uh, the skies will be opened. Mm -hmm. And when it doesn't open, then they say, no, you see, the minister misled us and therefore we went and invested. The issue for us is that, for example, we can be in level four. Instead of moving to level three, we can regress to level five. And I That's hope right. that message was gotten when Minister Lamini Suma was presenting. So you can think that we are making progress, then you have a huge bang and then you regress. But there's an issue around, and that's why I'm, I'm always saying, if we can follow what Prof Karim was, was doing, then we'd understand how to plan better, we'd understand how to rework our work and, and make sure that we can be able to provide the solutions that we need. So from our side, we're saying, we are projecting that we'll be able to function by end of the year, and therefore our plans are along those lines. But functioning along the end of the year, CISA means functioning mm. domestic tourism. In terms of the projections, in terms of the scenarios, both epidemiologically and the economists that we sit with, there isn't a chance for us to be able to see international traveling in South Africa in 2020. That's what we are told. Now, if we are to get the vaccine agently early coming, you look at what is being done with the vaccine, the trials and everything, and the projections, then that will be our area of being able to get more around international markets. So that's why I'm saying the recovery strategy starts with domestic. Where we plan for domestic, and one of the things we say, okay, it's winter, normally in terms of our stats, you'd see that we don't grow much in, 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 in winter. But post winter, then you start, normally we see up. I would want to see the sector functioning immediately after winter. I would want to see as we get into summer, encouraging people. Realistically, I can say that now, but is it the truth? It's not. I sit in the command council, I see the stats, I see the projections, I see the scenarios, and that's what even was presented by Prof Karim earlier, that most of us would have listened to. But it's not a realistic thing to say, would see this. And maybe just to share, when we started the work as IMC, one day I came back to share, I shared with the board, I shared with uh, TBCSA, to say at that time, we were given projections that we're likely to have almost around 3 million of infections if we do nothing. And we'd have mm. more than 200,000 deaths if we do nothing. And that's what led to government saying, let's put measures to prevent that. Let's put measures to ensure that we don't have high number of infection. If you look, compare us, when you look at the statistics that are being shared, at the time we started to have the virus, we were moving similarly path with UK in terms of numbers. You compare us with UK now, we almost flatter they've moved higher because of the interventions that we've done. So that's what we need to start remembering, that these interventions are meant to curb the virus, also to ensure that we have uh, more people not being infected. Now, our response as tourism should not be only about us looking at tourism to say, how do we survive? Let's look at ensuring that the full recovery so that we can fully come back into action, get our business back on track, and all that. Now, the question people will ask, Minister, when you say that, what do I do? I have employees today that I must yeah. pay. That's why we are saying those employees must be paid by UIF. Let's register them at UIF so that they can get money. 
what happens to you in terms of your uh, business? You are not getting any income. Let's get the packages that government has provided and benefit out of them. There's been various measures that government has been introducing. And I don't think those are the last ones. We'll continue as we go because projection initially was that we'll be in this for three months. Now it's extending. As it extends, we'll have to go back and work on the support in terms of economic support to the sectors so that we can be able to say sectors are able to survive during this time. Gotcha. If I may just say to everyone, I mean, this is one example where associations and, uh, and, and, and become so important because ultimately the association you sit on has a voice and a view on TBCSA and TBCSA is the body that consolidates all these views and makes representation uh, together to the government as well and also comes with recommendations. So I see a lot of people, they may have a lot of recommendations. Instead of them coming through one at a time, feed them through association that ultimately land up at TBCSA as the official voice of the sector as well. Minister, there's a theme here that is starting to, that's coming through as well. As um, you know, you the sector starts to feel as if they are, and maybe you've said some of this before, they kind of feel that they're being punished and being held back. And uh, they actually want to start trading tomorrow. Can you just reiterate the, the, the tight balance that we need to have? That, yes, we can open tomorrow and everyone trades, but what's the consequence of this? So just take us through some of the scenarios that you and your cabinet ministers go through in terms of unleashing the economy or drip feeding it out and why tourism is lower relative to others. No, I, I, I did get feedback as well. One of the colleagues called me. Uh, unfortunately, I was in a G20 meeting when Minister Mboweni had a press briefing and I understand one of the things he said was tourism is dead. So I immediately, when I got that message, I called him. I said, you can't say that tourism is not dead. We are going through a difficult time and therefore I do believe we are going to bounce back. Um, he did acknowledge to say, no, that's not what he meant. What he meant at that time, and I think it's important for me, sister, to explain this because yes. this feedback is coming through. What he meant was that at that time is that most of our programs in tourism department um, are going to have to be reprioritized. The budget, because it's not going to be spent immediately, is going to be reprioritized. Not that tourism is dead. So he literally apologized for that. Now, colleagues would remember one of the things that we had taken, government had taken a decision that tourism is going to be, is one of the priority sectors in terms of economic before COVID-19. And colleagues would have noted that we, we lived up to that uh, we committed to. Every speech that we did, government, uh, ministers, um, president, tourism was there. But the reality is that we got hit by COVID-19. Now, when COVID-19 hit us, it was an unpredictable thing, but it was about, as I'm saying, it's, it's about a virus that is spread through interaction. It's a virus that is spread through um, social means, so sort of that when you come together, then you are likely to get the virus. Now, what does that mean? It means it affects us as a tourism sector. We were, that's why we were the first one to be hit on. In Kebin, the spread, governments had to restrict movements had to restrict interaction. Now, meaning we can have conventions or conferences, mm. we can visit attractions, we can fly because borders are closed, they don't want the transmission being transferred from one country to the other, the epidemic, uh, pandemic being transferred from one country to the other. They don't want um, everybody to be uh, moving from, you know, the virus moving and spreading even more because it was not uh, extended. So that's the issue. That's how we got to find ourselves here. Now, we can't say it's not a reality. Our responsibility as a sector is to say, what are the things that we need to do to be able to come back fully? But it does mean that we are going to have to change the way we do things. That's the reality. Because if social distancing is the order of the day, mm it means we are going to have to change. Uh, how do you do tour guiding while social distancing, for example? How do you do, how do you have mice 
Uh, how do you have conference? How do you have exhibitions when you are social distancing? So that's the issue, colleagues. That's what currently it makes it difficult for us to interact. If you look at the issues around, even for example, let me just say, we've been dealing with a lot of um, issues around restaurants, where we were trying to get at least with the restaurants, be able to either do takeaways or restrict. And we're told, but we want less people on the streets. We don't want more people on the streets. People are going to leave to go to restaurants. Now we can mm -hmm. continue to argue and present our case as we do every time at the net joint and NCC. Now the next phase that we are working on, Caesar, from our side at, at, at the department is to make sure that we can be able to do a lot of work segmenting the sectors to say, this is what happens here. This is how we do risk uh, the restaurant. This is so that when we move, there's a new re uh, um, review. We are able to see quite a number of tourism activity back. But are we able to say we can see tourism activity full back, all of it at all once? I don't mm. think so. So the international traveling will continue because even if we lift the ban in South Africa, other countries are still having restrictions in their own countries. I do have quite a number of South Africans whom we were even able, unable to get a charter out because in those countries, a charter is not allowed to leave, no flights. Repatriation is not allowed. So you can see that every country has mm. its measures. Now, as we work, and that's why it's important for us to work at a global community, so that when we do inputs, we are able to input in such a manner that we are not left behind, but we can represent what the views of the country are. Gotcha. Thank you, Minister. I think you touched on a very important point there, that yes, we've got measures that we can take into account for our uh, conduct and how we respond to the pandemic, but uh, in our source markets, we absolutely have no control over. And if they don't get the handle on it, then they essentially stop being a, a source market to us. Uh, I see some of the comments coming through, and I want to reiterate again, uh, the industry needs to start having a voice. And uh, I see a lot of comments, and a lot of them are quite repetitive. Speak to the association that you belong to, that also belongs to TPCSA. That is the body that actually has a platform that interacts on a regular basis with the minister. So all recommendations around health protocols, operational protocols, ideas, and everything else will come through um, the, the TBCSA, uh, you know, in terms of but making sure I, there is the connection. Lisa, can I also yes. say, there's, if they do have, I would, I would love to receive those as well directly, if others are feeling, because you might find that somebody is not a member of TBCSA, and wants to send um, some inputs. I mean, we do have our officials in my office details on the website. They can send, there's a tourism, uh, um, what is it called? A hotline email, a toll free email a line, a call center number together with the email. Though it has been clocked, by the way, um, we've been receiving quite a lot of them. With the, with the lockdown, officials not being able to go to the office as well because we are all operating from home, um, that delayed. But would want to receive those. But I want to say, in terms of the recovery, we've made a provision to say, this is what we'd want to do. Can they make formal submissions to you as you help me to put together this um, recovery strategy? And there might be ideas that are coming through that will assist us because I'm one person that do not want to claim to be a, a to have monopoly of ideas, but wants people to come in and bring in ideas. I know that a number of people are not happy to say they are not going to be operating now. It's unfortunately, unfortunately that we can have. It's not up to the Minister of Tourism to open the tourism sector. It's the National Command Council advised by the technical teams that are looking from a security point, from a health point of view. So there's a lot of balancing act. We come from the economic side, we make presentations. We make representation to say, this is what will get our economy back. We put the numbers, this sector, for example, ours hires many people. There are a lot of people who are having their jobs. There are a lot of business and it's an entry, it's, just, it's must, you know, you present that. 
but they test it. There's a system, there's a model they use, they put it there, it comes out great. Right. They say, go back, rework on this, then we continue to do that. So it's based on the modeling of the pandemic. As long as you have the pandemic grown, many of the sectors are not going to be able to function. That's the reality and that's the truth. Thank you for that, Minister. And uh, I think uh, Ministers invited even those that are not part of uh, TBCSA to go to the website www.tourism.gov.za and in there there are contact details of the, of the contact center and email addresses for you to actually launch your views, thoughts and ideas as well. Uh, I also see that we have about 700 uh, different questions coming through. We will also be consolidating these and also uh, answering them and make sure that they are addressed. So that, that certainly is taken into account. Minister, we don't have much time left, but as we draw to a close, there's two things I'd like to ask you. The first one is uh, on uh, Africa's tourism in Daba. Um, it's been postponed. What is the latest on that one uh, that you may want to share with uh, the, all the people on the platform? Yeah, initially when we postponed it, remember we were hoping that uh, we can be able to host it at least in the um, tourism month, which is September. Um, currently, it's looking very unlikely, as I said. We are not able to get into that space. Um, so tourism activities from our side in terms of events are looking at us being able to start at level, for example, an event like that within the my sector. It's at level one when you look at the proposals that have been put in. So it's, it's a most difficult thing, unfortunately. I know we've been able to take a decision. The board has sent me a request to take a decision to cancel Lilizela Awards. Um, that has been taken as a decision because it's not going to be able to, um, we won't, won't be able to host it. Similarly with um, Tourism Mindaba, we won't be able to host it this year. Okay, thank you for that. And then Minister, um, What's your last message to the sector that you want to give them? You know, as uh, we've painted a picture of uh, level two being some time off, possibly around December, we've spoken a bit about de-risking the initiatives uh, in terms of getting the sector back up again. Uh, but the distance between now and December is quite some time. Um, what's your message to the sector as, as a closer? Look, I do understand, Sisa. There's, there's a lot of pain in the sector. Um, a lot of people are going through a lot. Um, I get those through my emails, through letters, through interactions with TBCSA and as well as um, various um, organizations that we interact with. My message is that let's hold each other's hand, let's work together because if we start working against each other, uh, if we start saying to each other, it's not going to work, we need to be able to support each other. Where there are issues that we can give feedback to, give feedback so that we can improve, support you. One of the things that we are doing as the department is to continue to find opportunities for the sector during this time. That's why we did a lot of work around the quarantine sites, looking at that to get um, activities. We'll continue to do that. And I think many of our sector people should not lose hope uh, to say it's all doom and gloom. Um, we're going to continue to do that. One another thing that we are looking at is to continue to be able to be the voice in the, in, in the government to say, in terms of relief packages, we must remember that there are sectors that have come to a standstill. One of the last things I want to say, Sisa, is that it's not going to be easy we are a sector, because if I talk like this and somebody will say, but minister is comforted because we moved from an income to zero. We are aware of that. That's why we started, we were, we were the first to say, we're going to look at the relief fund. And unfortunately it has been delayed. And we thought by this time would be either at phase two or phase three of what we, we, we are able to, because we are not able to approach treasury until we spend what we have. So we need to spend this 200, and then we can approach Treasury to say we're looking for more money for the sector. So that's what we intend to do, provide relief mechanisms and support for the sector to be able to survive. Um, and so that when we come back, we are able to do the marketing. I've committed myself as the ministers to say, 
we'll do whatever it takes to, when we recover, that's why we're working on this recovery plan, to say we're going to market aggressively and ensure that we are able to gain our spot in the global community, our spot in the country, and also make sure that we are able to market the entire country, every corner of this country, every single business to be able to be part of this. We note that it's not every time that we're able to converse. Uh, we want to converse more, maybe even through uh, platforms. The team has been working on various platforms for us to engage and close the gap, listen to feedback. We'll take the feedback, rework with the team to make sure that what we bring as a recovery strategy it's something that all of us agree on. It's something that can help us. We'll share with TBCSA by next week, this week and next week, we are having meetings with them in terms of the conversations around the risk. But I want to say to the sector, it's not only the responsibility of the minister to be able to do all this work. You are the people who are in this business. You are the people who are doing this work and would want to hear from you what is it that you think we should be doing? We commit our resources, we commit our time, we'll commit because our responsibility, because we are not the owners of the establishments and all that, we'll commit to doing the marketing for this country and selling the country so that tourists can come back. We're committing to continue to be the voice of the sector in the platforms that needs to be speaking to them on behalf of the sector, taking your message of pay taking your message of saying we are facing difficulty and therefore we need government to support us. But I think one last thing I need to say is that we can only do that if we work together. We can only do that if we do not only put our hands on our heads and complain, but work together to find solutions. I think that's the most important thing. We need to Thank be you. able to say, even on the marketing itself, we do have ideas. As I said, we want to launch a platform where people can book and would want to have establishments being part of that platform so that we can guarantee the tourism, domestic tourism market. We would support the bidding, I said to the team, go out and look for major events that are coming in the coming year, two years. We would go out and look at the packages that we need to put together to be able to support the mindset. Because it's going to be important for us to put attractive packages that will attract those major conferences. Maybe what we used to have is not going to be enough. That's what the work we must do. I've tasked the team to give me that, to give me a list of conferences that we must do. And one of the areas that I started saying, for example, your UN related meetings that mm -hmm. normally would happen are the ones some of the events that I would want to target to come to South Africa because I know they would be guaranteed to happen once the lockdown is out. So those are some of the things that we are working on to make sure that that happens, um, that make sure that we are able to regain our space. We have been in touch and supporting the embassies of various countries as they repatriate, as part of ensuring that we do build and defend our market. Now, part of the issue that's why the last one is around us being able to communicate. We've done uh, adverts through SAT, and some of those adverts have been sent to our market, source markets, where we are continuing to make sure that the people don't forget us. Uh, you note know that some of the issues have been happening in, in, global community, in global platforms as well, where we're advertising South Africa, so that those countries and those tourists are not forgetting about South Africa. So we're doing our best to make sure that potential tourists for the future remember in their minds, in their heads, that there is a country called South Africa. And when all is done, when the virus is gone, they're able to come. I had a couple of those who were here who left who said, I planned my wedding and I intend to come back. And those are the people that we must make sure that we don't lose, they're able to come back. So that's the work that we continue to do in the background. And we'll go out again to do partnerships to make sure that those who are working in, set, in sectors or in source markets, that we have an interest, we partner with them so that we can leverage on the value. 
of we, what we can do. We'll go back to the areas, for example, we had three key source markets that we started working on. When you look at the stats for January and February, you'd see that they were starting to see positive uh, response from those markets internationally. We'll go back and work in those markets. Um, and I have committed myself as a minister doing that work and driving that work to be able to regain our position in those markets. So with those few words, I want to say, what we need now is to be able to put together a recovery strategy that we can present to the nation, we can present to the global community. And say South Africa is ready when the, fly, the skies are open, when the borders are open to receive tourists. Secondly, uh, sorry, lastly, is the issue of uh, those who are affected. Let's continue to source the opportunities. I am appealing. The UIF, where you have difficulty, please reach out. We made sure that TBCSA is a platform so that you can have them. Don't drown alone. Uh, there is support that we are providing. What we have might not be enough, but we'll continue to source. We'll continue to find other avenues to be able to help. So that's it from me, um, Sisa. And I do believe that we'll, we can continue to work. And I do commit to uh, in future, having the conversations again and answering more questions from the sector. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you for your time. Thank you for taking us through some of your thoughts as well. I just want to say to everybody, this is the last, the last time we're having these conversations. Uh, when we did a poll, you actually indicated that every two weeks we should be actually interacting with each other. And the environment is changing on a regular basis. We have to make sure that we are basically aligned. Uh, two themes I'm picking up as well is that one, uh, quite a strong comment there around get eight or ten establishment owners around in a webinar and get them to make suggestions and uh, conversations. Love that idea as well. And the other one is to get some of these associations on a webinar panel as well so that they can also interact with all of you and take into account so you can get a sense in terms of is the information that you're providing going through and landing ultimately will be. So I'll definitely be taking up those and interacting with everybody. I think that the positives of the COVID has actually um, really pushed us to have more uh, consistent conversations, you know, uh, with a bigger crowd and definitely will get this up and running. Minister, thank you for committing that this is not the last time uh, that you'll be uh, joining us and we will be pulling you from time to time because you are insider in the inside, if I can put it that way. So uh, thank well, you very yeah, much. Well, definitely, sis, I do commit to having these conversations, but also one of the things I said to the team, I've asked the office to make sure that we are, because one of the challenges, sis, is to see, we have general discussions. Um, one of the things that we want to see is that let's deal with, for example, if we are to deal with a conversation around mice, have a conversation around mice and then have a conversation around, uh, you know, um, restaurants and all those things so that we can get more feedback on what needs to be done. I had a conversation organized by Wendy the other day with um, restaurants owners, but not, it was not broad enough. Um, so we'd want to have so, such conversations so that we can get into deeper issues that affect that particular segment of the sector. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone. Thank you, Minister. Thank you for your time. Much appreciated. As I said, we'll be taking all of these inputs, questions, and uh, making sure that uh, we respond uh, to all of them and theme them up. But we will be essentially be uh, in, um, communicating our program probably for the next uh, two months or so into what we'll be discussing. And uh, we look forward to your interaction. And uh, goodbye, everybody. Thank you, Minister. Thank you.